All right. I have to do this for the benefit of our online church. I want to uh, begin by thanking everyone who prayed. Uh, we did, as you can see, obtain our permit. And by the grace of God and for the glory of God, we're able to have our first service here today in our beautiful new church that God has blessed us with exceedingly, abundantly, above and beyond anything we could have ever thought or imagined. Now, we are still about $150,000 short, but God, <laughs> we are trusting that God's going to provide all that we need uh, at the time that we need it. I want to, uh, and I, I hope he doesn't hate me for doing this, but I really want to take this opportunity to thank Eric Anderson for all that he did these last nine months. And he's not looking at me. That means he's hating my guts right now. So <laughs> um, he has been here for the better part of nine months. And uh, we're just so very thankful to you, Eric, for all your uh, work here and God calling you here and we just want to take this opportunity to thank you Also for the benefit of our online church We want want to thank Frank Kessler as well who is still here from Nashville, Tennessee and uh, He has just been a huge blessing to us as a church and even really to Eric uh, personally as well. Just a huge uh, help. So we want to thank Frank Kessler too. And lastly, because our online church uh, it wasn't, uh, re wasn't recorded for them, we have uh, three guys from Tennessee here. Uh, we have Mark Ray, Mark Henderson, and Dave Harris, and they were here all night getting this set up for us today, and they're still here. So if you see them sleeping during my prophecy update, they're excused, they can do that, okay? We want to thank them as well. All right, let's get started. For today's prophecy update, I want to talk about what I would argue is the proverbial handwriting on the wall related to Israel and the United States. And more specifically, as it relates to the current U.S. president who leaves office in 109 days, 10 hours, 43 minutes, and 55 seconds as of 6.31.05. Yes, you can. The reason I know that is because somebody bought me as a gift a countdown clock. That's how I know that. Okay. Now, barring something happening prior to November, the next president's posture concerning Israel may in fact seal America's fate. It's been said that this is perhaps the most important election of our lifetime because of what is at stake. And I would concur in the sense that what is at stake is the nation of Israel. And I base that statement on what God told Abraham in Genesis 12 verses 2 and 3. He says to Abraham, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Doubtless you heard about both Trump and Clinton meeting with the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu last Sunday. He was in the United States for the UN General Assembly, and both the Democratic and Republican nominees met with him. Trump met with him first. And according to the Jerusalem Post, Trump told Netanyahu that he would recognize Jerusalem 
as Israel's united capital. This is profound. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Quoting the Post, in meeting the Republican presidential nominee, Netanyahu thanked him for his continued support for Israel, his commitment to continued pressuring of Iran, and for his opposition to efforts at the United Nations to impose terms of a peace agreement with the Palestinians. That was Netanyahu's meeting with Trump. But listen to this stark contrast from Clinton's meeting, in which she called for, quote, direct negotiations for a two-state solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict after her meeting Sunday evening with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who, quoting the Post, is concerned that her former boss, U.S. President Barack Obama, may take the issue to an international stage. What he's referring to in expressing his concern is the rumored bid of Obama to become the UN General Secretary once he leaves office. To say that Netanyahu has legitimate concerns would be a gross understatement by virtue of Obama's remarks at the memorial service for former Israeli President Shimon Peres. I don't know if you watched some of the coverage of this service in Israel, but according to Ynet News, while eulogizing former President Shimon Peres, U.S. President Obama said that, quote, speaking of Peres, he would have said that the Jewish nation wasn't born to control another nation. What? What? Well, to add insult, and this is at, oh, by the way, <laughs> this is at a memorial service for the Israeli president in which there were over 70 world leaders in attendance, absent one Vladimir Putin from Russia. Why? It's believed that he did not attend because Obama was there. Hang on to that for a moment. We're going to come back to the significance of that here shortly. But to add insult to injury, one website posted a copy of Obama's remarks at Perez's funeral in Jerusalem, indicating that the remarks had been given in Jerusalem, Israel. Now, I wish I had the slide to show you, but I have a screenshot of the remarks in print, and I have circled where it says, Jerusalem, Israel, but Israel is crossed out. You know why? Because the United States does not recognize Jerusalem as belonging to Israel. Jerusalem, I hope you understand, is an international city. It does not belong to Israel as far as the United States is concerned and with the United States, other nations as well. That's another topic for another time. We have discussed this. Perhaps we'll revisit this at a future date in the not too distant future. But suffice it to say for now, they crossed out Israel and they did it late Friday afternoon when the press office sent out a correction to the previous email in which Israel was still there, but it was crossed out with a line through it. Now, this striking out of Israel from the header of a transcript pales in comparison to the dangers facing Israel on the world stage due in large part to what's happening now between Russia and the U.S. over Syria. It's getting really bad. Last Sunday, 
during our prophecy update, Russia had ramped up their bombing in Aleppo, and much to the consternation of the United States of America, at least as far as Obama is concerned. But the Jerusalem Post published an article in which they quote former Israeli ambassador to the United Nations, Ron Prasor, whom some of you uh, met when he was here in Hawaii. This is the UN ambassador that I had the privilege of meeting and got a letter from so that we could go to Israel uh, last year and I could take it with me and not be detained and interrogated for hours at the <laughs> airport and I showed him the letter and uh, I love it when God does that. I, they just took the letter and they saw that it was from uh, Prasor, the UN ambassador on his letterhead from his New York office and uh, instead of being detained for three to four hours, I was only uh, detained for three to four minutes. In fact, those of you who went to Israel with us last year, I actually felt bad because I got my bags before you guys did. It was the first time ever and I was just thrilled in Jesus' name. <laughs> but I waved to you at least as I walked by, right? Didn't I? I hope I did. Sorry if I didn't. But according to Prosor, the escalation in rhetoric between Russia and the United States over Syria's civil war is creating a dangerous situation for Israel. We have here a dangerous situation. It is dangerous, by the way, also to Israel because we find ourselves right in the middle, Prosor said. We coordinate with Russia and the Americans are an important strategic asset for us. Prosser said that a conflict between the Americans and Russians could create a very uncomfortable reality for Israel. The former envoy of the UN said that the level of rhetoric in recent days between the world powers is unprecedented in Syria's civil war. There is a head-on confrontation between the world powers who both currently maintain a presence in the arena, not through proxies, he stated. As far as we are concerned as a country that is in the area with these world powers who are in the midst of an escalating conflict, the arena is complicated. The United States accused Russia of barbarism in Syria on Sunday as war planes supporting Syrian government forces pounded Aleppo and Moscow said ending the civil war was almost impossible. A diplomatic solution to the fighting looked unlikely as U.S. and Russian diplomats disagreed at a U.N. Security Council meeting called to discuss the violence which has escalated since a ceasefire collapsed last week. That's presupposing you'll, you'll call it a ceasefire. It was nothing of the sorts. This Times of Israel report should come as no surprise. It seems that the U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry is warning that Washington was on the brink of ending its talks with Russia on the Syrian conflict over the assault on Aleppo. I hope you understand the intensity and the seriousness and the enormity of what is taking place in Syria as we speak. And I hope you're also able to connect the dots with the prophecy in Isaiah 17. And I'll add to it Jeremiah 49 and 50, which we're, we'll talk about more Syria here in just a moment. Kerry said, quote, there is no notion or indication of seriousness of purpose with what is taking place right now, speaking of Russia. He told a conference in the U.S. Capitol a day after warning his Russian counterpart, Sergei Lavrov, he would end talks unless Moscow halts the assault on Aleppo. I would venture to say that Russia has already halted talks with the U.S. And here we are threatening that we're going to halt talks with them. And by the way, have you noticed that the United States of America today seemingly has to ask Russia for permission to do anything in the Middle East? You know why that is, right? And you know who it is that's behind that, right? 
So the U.S. is warning and accusing Russia, and Russia is also warning and accusing the U.S. This is a recipe for disaster. This forms what metaphorically some would refer to as the perfect prophetic storm, and this perhaps could be the calm before the storm. Ynet News published a, an article with the headline reading, Russia accuses U.S. of threatening support for nuclear attack. Remember in Matthew 24 when Jesus answered the disciples who asked him about what would be the signs of the end of the age and of your return? And Jesus responded by saying that there would be wars and rumors of wars, threats of wars, that nation would rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, that nation would threaten nation, and there would be wars and threats of wars. Well, this is exactly what is happening, and it couldn't happen with two more important and powerful nations on earth, Russia and the United States. The Russian Foreign Ministry is accusing the Pentagon of making a veiled threat to back its allies in an attack on Russia with nuclear weapons. U.S. Defense Secretary Ash Carter on Monday accused Russia of, quote, nuclear saber rattling and argued that even though the Cold War is long over, nuclear weapons are still needed to deter Russia and other potential aggressors from thinking they could get away with a nuclear attack. Moscow responded Thursday by saying that Carter's statement amounted to the U.S. threatening to use its nuclear weapons in support of an aggression against Russia waged by its allies. It added that Russia will have to take, and this is important, retaliatory measures to protect its security. So we're all in Syria. Are we, who are we fighting in Syria? Who are we supposed to be fighting in Syria? Who are we actually fighting in Syria? Could it be that the United States is at war with Russia in Syria? Could it be that this is the catalyst, if you will, to the fulfillment of the prophecies concerning Syria and Damascus becoming a ruinous heap, so much so that it is uninhabitable? Now, if this weren't bad enough, on Wednesday, the Jerusalem Post published a report about how Iran has missiles that can hit Israel. We've talked about this, but this was just on Wednesday of last week. Let me quote from the Post. A senior commander in Iran's Revolutionary Guard said Tuesday that Iran is in possession of missiles that can hit Israel. Iran's press TV quoted the commander as telling reporters that we do not need missiles with a range of over 2,000 kilometers. The longest range required for Iran's missiles is the Israeli-occupied lands. In other words, Israel is the occupier. The commander warned, threatened, that, quote, the Zionist regime is our biggest target. He stated that Iran's Zafalgar tactical ballistic missile was set to become operational in March of 2017, which is the end of the current Iranian calendar year. The missile can carry out precision attacks against airport tarmacs and targets on the ground. Now, I share all of this to say this. I believe that we are inching closer with each passing day to the fulfillment of chiefly the Isaiah 17 prophecy concerning Syria. It wasn't that long ago, I would venture to say, even about maybe a year ago, October of 2015, that we were inching closer, not with each passing day, but more like with each passing month or so. The developments, there were developments, but they were not as swift as they are 
today. It's happening now on a daily basis. It is, for me, getting increasingly difficult to keep up with if you only knew how much I delete <laughs> from a prophecy update. Otherwise, we'd be here until the rapture, <laughs> going over all of the developments just from the previous week. Ynet News reported about how that the opposition Syrian National Coalition is saying a political solution was, quote, no longer a viable option. Now, I don't know when they finally came to that realization, but for many, this has been a foregone conclusion. The Syrian situ situation in Syria not only is not going to get resolved politically, it's not going to get resolved, period. It will not get resolved. That's not what my Bible says. My Bible says that it is going to get worse and fast, and that Damascus, Syria, will become a ruinous heap. And that is the, that is the prophecy in Isaiah 17. Well, in last week's update, we looked at the reasons why the fulfillment of Isaiah 17 and Ezekiel 38 were on the cusp of being fulfilled. And I want to close today's prophecy update with the reason as to why it matters. In other words, we, we know that Isaiah 17 and Ezekiel 38 are close, but why does it matter to us as Christians? that were this close. Now, I realize that I run the risk of maybe offering an oversimplification when I answer this, but I'll try to explain it as best as I can why it matters. The reason it matters is because of the timing of the rapture in concert with both Isaiah 17 and Ezekiel 38. There are other prophecies, but these chiefly are the main two that today are in play. And it's the timing of the rapture in relation to these prophecies. One of the questions that I'm often asked is, when do I believe the rapture will take place in terms of the timing of Ezekiel 38? Is it going to be before? Is it going to be simultaneously with? Or will it be shortly after? Obviously, the, the question comes as a result of knowing that not only are these prophecies in play and soon to be fulfilled, but also a correct biblical understanding of the timing of the rapture. And I suppose you could say in some ways that this is also why we need to know why we believe what we believe concerning the rapture. Now this is under a lot of attack today, the pre-tribulation rapture. There is a constituency of Christians in some circles that argue that it really doesn't matter. They hope it's pre. They, they pray it's pre. But they're going to prepare because it might be mid or it might be post. And I would submit to you that, um, well, how do I say this without sounding unloving? I can't. Shame on you. you. You can't do that. That's, that's laziness at best and, and, and ignorance. Why? Think about the impact that living your life like that has on your life. Listen, if I'm not convinced of the truth of the pre-tribulation rapture, it will affect and impact the way I live my life on a daily basis. Because if, if it's that fuzzy and I'm, I'm uncertain, well then I'm not really looking for and longing for, as we just saw with the Apostle Paul, the Lord's return. I'm, I'm wishy-washy and so I'm kind of living my life in both arenas. And I don't know how anybody can do that. Listen, if it weren't for the truth of the pre-tribulation rapture, I would go out of my mind. See, I know why I believe what I believe. 
and it affects everything that I do. Because I know that soon and very soon that trumpet is going to sound and the dead in Christ are going to rise first and we who are alive and remain are going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. That's our blessed hope. Well, I suppose you could say that this is the common denominator with all of this knowing why we believe what we believe. Because if you're uncertain, then even your understanding of Bible prophecy is going to be skewed. You'll look at Isaiah 17 very differently. And I'll add with less urgency. When I know that the rapture could happen at any time, that it's imminent, could happen at any time, that has a profound impact on how I live my life. And it causes me to view these prophecies through that lens, knowing that I am witnessing these prophecies beginning to come to pass. Here's the bottom line. The rapture, we don't know for sure in relation to Isaiah 17 or Ezekiel 38. It could be before. It could be simultaneously with. It could be shortly after. One thing is for sure, the rapture of the church will be close in proximity to these prophecies specifically. Now think this through with me. If we're watching these prophecies being fulfilled in real time, right before our very eyes, then wouldn't it stand to reason that if the rapture is that close in proximity to the fulfillment of these prophecies, that the rapture is closer than any of us might think? I would argue that yes, it is. And it would behoove us to consider what Jesus said in Luke 21, 28. When you see these things begin to come to pass, look up and lift up your head because your redemption draws nigh. That's the proximity, the closeness of it, the urgency because of it. I want to close by sharing with you, those of you who have never called upon the name of the Lord to be saved, I want to share very simply the gospel before we partake together of communion on this Rosh Hashanah, by the way. Uh, praise the Lord. I, God is so good to allow us to be in our building. On this day, we celebrate communion, and it's also the Jewish feast of Rosh Hashanah. But I want to share with you very simply the gospel, the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ before we partake together of communion. First, I have to share with you the bad news. It's been said that the badder the bad news is, the gooder the good news will be. I know that's not proper English, but that's the truth. The badder the bad news is, the gooder the good news will be. And you know what the bad news is? We're all sinners. We were all born sinners. Romans 3.10 says, there is no one righteous, not even one. In Romans 3.23, we're told that all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God. In Romans 5 verse 12, Paul says, just as sin entered the world through one man, speaking of Adam, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men because all sinned. That's the wages of, death, of, of sin is death. It's the death penalty. That's Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death, but, and this is where we transition from the really bad news to the really good news. The good news is the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. In Romans 5, 8, it says, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, 
Christ died for us. And Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, tell us what we can do to be born again, to be saved. It says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. And Romans 10, 13 lastly says, everyone, all, all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. If you have never called upon the name of the Lord, I implore you today to do so. Once you all stand, we'll pray. Loving Heavenly Father, how is it possible for us to thank you enough for what you did for us, sending your only begotten Son to us because of your love for us, to die on the cross and pay in full the penalty of our sin so that whosoever would believe in him would not perish in hell for all eternity, but be saved and have everlasting life. Lord, thank you for the free gift of eternal life. Thank you that we're saved by grace through faith. It's not of works, lest any of us should ever find ourselves boasting. Thank you that it's a gift we receive, not a wage that we earn. Lord, thank you. Lord, if there's anybody here in this church that has never called upon you, I pray that today they would do that. For anybody watching online or listening by radio or some other means that has never called upon you, I pray that today, today would be the day of their salvation. Lord, thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're able to stay with us and partake together with us of the Lord's table, we would certainly encourage you to do so. If you have to leave, uh, we understand. Have a, a blessed day. Uh, you'll free up a parking spot for somebody else <laughs> coming to second service. <laughs> we already, it's unbelievable. I guess we needed all that asphalt. But uh, if you uh, must leave, then... Uh, be blessed, and the Lord bless you this week. Uh, we're going to have you come up. We have two uh, table uh, in the front now with the elements, and then I think there's also one in the back somewhere right there in the back. So uh, get the elements, uh, take them back to your seat, and then take your seat, and then wait so we can partake together. And by the way, uh, for those of you visiting with us here today, the elements are all prepackaged, both the bread and the cup. So go ahead and come on up.
in Luke's gospel, the 22nd chapter, we have the account of what we affectionately call the Last Supper. And Luke, by the Holy Spirit, writes that when the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you, for I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. If you'll take the packaging and peel back the top part, though, you'll find the bread. And just hold on to it for a moment. We hold in our hands a symbol of the body of Jesus Christ. His body was broken, not his bones. No bone could be broken and no bone was broken according to the prophecy of the Messiah. It was his skin that was broken. And his broken skin would then also lead to the shedding of his blood. One of the things that I've always found intriguing is that Jesus, from his broken body, bled in seven places, seven being the number of completion. He bled from both of his wrists, that's two. Both of his feet, that's four. From his head, from the crown of th thrones, that's five. From his back, from the lashings, that's six. And then finally, from his side, when he was pierced, by that Roman soldier on the cross that day. Seven is the number of completion. And it was after this completion of the work on the cross that Jesus could say, it is finished. It is finished. What's finished? The payment. The debt has been paid. It's finished. It's complete. Sin has been paid for in full because of his body broken for us. Would you partake with me? Lord, as the bread dissolves in our mouths, as tasteless as it is, it does serve for us as a reminder of the bitterness of that which you tasted on our behalf that day. Lord, thank you for giving us this as a reminder. We do remember and we do need that reminder that you died for us, paid in full for us. Lord, thank you. In Jesus' name. Luke goes on to write, in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. If you take the rest of the packaging off the top, you'll have the cup. And again, just hold on to it for a moment. We hold in our hands a symbol of the purest blood from the spotless Lamb of God, the Passover Lamb of God, the blood that was shed in our stead for the remission of our sins, not the covering. In the Old Testament, Hebrew was kofar, to cover. It was merely a covering until the new covenant. But in the new covenant, it's a removing. 
a complete removing as far, Isaiah says, as the east is from the west, so much so he remembers them no more. That's how powerful and pure this blood, as is symbolized in this cup, was. By partaking today, what we're saying is that we remember and accept his payment and his shed blood in our stead for our sins. It's a commemoration and it's also a celebration. Think about it. We are celebrating symbolically the removing of all of our sins. Oh my goodness. All? <laughs> Listen, I'll, I'll just speak for myself. I got plenty. <laughs> That's a lot. All. Every sin. Every sin I have committed. Every sin I'm committing. Not that I'm committing sin right now. <laughs> and any sin I have yet to commit. Paid for in full. And removed as far as the east is from the west. Because of his blood shed. Would you partake with me? And once you do, please stand. Lord, thank you so much. Thank you for allowing us, enabling us to have our service here today in this beautiful church building that you've given us. Lord, thank you for this day that we celebrate the communion table. Lord, we are so grateful to you for all that you've done and all that you are doing and Moreover, Lord, even that which you will yet future do. Lord, we love you so much, and we thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. And uh, we are going to have uh, some finger food over here on the side in our fellowship hall, if you're able to stay. Uh, again, if not, have a blessed week. And Lord willing, we'll see you right here on Thursday night, 7 o'clock.